when we got in, we were all choking, crying. It was gas, and we'd been made walk through a room filled with gas, burning tears from the eyes. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them, and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd, and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is my family. There were a couple of public beheadings. In order to kill them, you've got to be a little bit angry. Not psychotic, but just angry. We could look down Frankfurt and see it on fire. Stuff blowing up everywhere. There will be no surrender. And then they had to fight an enemy in amongst we got children. 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 I could never often. not go back. They were my friends and they felt the top She did say, you've changed. A soldier put everything on the line to help one of our blokes. Avis Quarrell is a veteran of the Second World War. She joined the Australian Women's Army Service. The AWAS were based in Australia taking on the roles of drivers, canteen workers, cooks, typists, signalers, and more. Ava spoke to Angus Horton about her family's service over the two world wars and her own in the 1940s. I'm Angus Horton, and I'm speaking today with Avis Quarrell. Avis, welcome to the show. Thank you for asking me to be part of it. Avis where were you born? In Turang, about uh, 30 kilometres from where I'm living at the moment in Warrnambool. And when were you born? 30th of July 1923. I was 95 last month. Oh, well, happy birthday for last month. Good on you. <laughs> Thank you. And you grew up with four younger brothers. That's right. Did your father fight in the First World War? Yes, he joined up in South Australia in the 10th Battalion. Fought at Lone Pine. After it was evacuated from there, he'd been injured and was in hospital in England. And when he rejoined the fighting, he was sent to the 14th Battalion and became one of the bacon stealers and along the song where he won his CCM. Did he talk to you much about that afterwards? Never talked at all. And uh, because of not talking about it. Two of my brothers had different versions. One said he got the DCM on Gallipoli, but Dad told me himself it was on the son that his captain got the VC and he was a sergeant and got the DCM. That's all I know. And we've had a difficulty over the years finding just where my father had been. My, my grandson is an avid researcher. And, uh, okay, Dad's not here any longer to decry different versions we've heard, so I can only say what I've just said. He ran away from school at a very early age and went working in a sawmill in Gippsland with his father. And his father was also connected with wars because when he was a young man, now this young prior to 1850, there were skirmishes in India, and he trained horses for the Indian Army. So war service of one means or another goes back a long way. And did that war service filter into your brothers as well? Into my eldest brother, who joined the Air Force, and my third brother, who ran away just prior to war being declared over, and Dad caught him getting on a truck to go to the rookie camp, and he was 16. <laughs> oh, so we were all service happy. And out of interest, have you still got your Dad's medals, the Gallipoli Star and the others? My eldest nephew has a replica of Dad's medals because when I was 15 and we were living in Kensington in Melbourne, the medals were stolen along with my much and my mother's little piece of gold, and we've never been able to track them down. Well, your dad's name would be engraved on his medal, so if anyone hears this and wants to bring the medals home, they can always contact us. But um, I'm sorry to hear that. My grandson's done such a lot of research, and we just can't track them down. So, Avis, you grow up during the Great Depression. Do you have memories of that time? Yes. I began school when I was six in Dixie 
and at that time would have been 1929, in the midst of the Depression. And with Dad having to be a returned man, he was a fully trained A-grade plus mechanic. Cars were just becoming popular and mechanics were needed, but he never had a permanent job. He would go where he was needed. And the result of that was that in my eight years of schooling, I went to 32 schools. Wow. They were mostly all over Victoria, and I didn't even sit for the merit certificate at the end of it because in 1939 there was a huge outbreak of polio in Melbourne, and the parents took all of us away from school. They didn't want us to get polio. But the ironic thing was, after the Christmas period, not even 14, and I was sent out to get a job to work. I was still amongst people that had polio. So funny sort of a childhood. Well, it sounds like you had to really work hard in very hard times. People who do wrong today when their court says, I've had a hard life, when I read that in the papers, I think you don't know what a hard life is. Ava's a couple of years later, and you're about 16, war breaks out in September 39. Do you remember what that reaction was like in your family? Yes, my father, who was a tough individual, broke down and cried. He just rested his arms on the dining room table and cried like, I would have myself, I was a kid. I could perhaps guess that after him enduring the absolute horrors of Gallipoli and indeed the Western Front, to think that that terrible sacrifice hadn't ended all this fighting and here we were literally a couple of decades later resuming the war against the old foe. Well, the thing I remember Dad saying more than anything, and he was not a religious man, but he was so sincere and he said... Thank God you kids are not old enough to go. He had a family of five and uh, he was just so grateful that the kids weren't of the age to enlist. And I understand that that didn't stop you, though. You wanted to join as soon as you could. I had a private war with my father for oh, about 14 months before he finally gave in and let me join. And the war then started to get on and the, the men came home from Egypt and had to go up north of Australia and so forth. Among them are two or three of my cousins, one who died in a prisoner of war camp on Hainan Island. After a year of fighting with Daddy, finally gone, gave his consent. And then he was as proud as Punch. So, Avis, what were your options in joining the armed forces back then? Everything except go overseas. So you joined the Australian Women's Army Service, I understand, in 1943. And where do you do your basic training? Dali, military camp. And what was that like? It was okay, and I got to learn what it was like to talk to girls. Because I'd grown up in an all-male family, moving from school to school to school every few months, I didn't know how to make friends with girls. And Avis... You then were off to Kapuka. Can you tell us about that? I went to Kapuka after my three weeks rookie training at Dali and I was put into a mechanical unit, searchlights, and I was no longer a private, I became gunner. It was a whole new thing to me. They were all just military, but OK. Searchlights was part of an artillery regiment, so... A corporal was a bombardier and your um, small unit became a battery and, and yeah, I had to learn a whole new Morse code, uh, phonetics, the alphabet, you know, it was able to make a Charlie Dodd and right through to Z. The numbers, you had to speak a whole new language too. We didn't say the numerals one, two, three, four. It was one, two, three, four so that everybody could understand because they were overemphasised. We had to learn the standard telephone message drills, how to read and ask for the right signal strengths. And then it, after we'd learned all those basic things of communication, then came the actually working on the search loss. Now, with my father being an A-grade mechanic, when he used to bring work home, there were piles of protective stuff put on the table and he'd bring a small four-cylinder motor. They could go on the table 
and my eldest brother and I would be one each side of Dad and he'd say, what was this? So we could say it was a spark plug or whatever part it was. So my brother and I had a... It was unnatural grounding in mechanics. So when I got into searchlights and I didn't choose to go, it's where, where I was directed to go, they were amazed that I knew so many parts of a motor because a little four-cylinder motor wasn't much different in action as a eight- or 12-cylinder Ruston Ornsby. So I felt I had it made when I went there. And Avis, can you talk about your family at this stage? Were they serving in the war? In between when I was in Sydney Searchlight and I did driving, I got posted to East Sail Airfield in Gippsland. We got in and were told to just put our kit bags in the wreck hut and the Salvation Army, who looked after the service people, made us tea and one thing and another. And all of a sudden, a group of Air Force chaps came in. One of them let a yell out of him. He said, Sish! And uh, I lifted my head. That sounded like my brother Bill. And lo and behold, it was. He had joined the Air Force while I was Sydney, and I had never seen him in uniform until that point. Now, the 18 girls in a searchlight unit, they were all over us, and Bill says, no, let me let me hug my sister. He says, sis, have you got 10 bob on you? Which was typical of him. But all the girls wanted to know, oh, you'll be able to introduce us to some of your Air Force mates. Oh, ripper. And it was the most joyous occasion. Talk about your day-to-day schedule of your work down at East Sale. What our work consisted of at East Sale was that we had to have our lights up every night because the east sail ground had bombers of both fighter which is not a bomber and Beaufort bombers and Hudson bombers and their training was night time work because at the time they were thinking yeah, if Australia got bombed it would be done at night time which was not so risky and so it was there that I had the first feeling of being useful because we had to put the lights up on the bombers and they had to try to get out of the lights. So it was a two-way training session. Anyway, it was good. So the day consisted of morning was a bit of sport, lunch, afternoon you still had to have lectures. Then we had to go out to locations, wait for the planes to take off and then get them in it. Then they had to try to get out of it and we had to keep them at it. We usually knocked off just on daybreak because the searchlight's not much good after the sun's up and um, go back and have breakfast, into bed and get up just prior to lunchtime and go back out to the searchlight site, maintain the stuff. Anyway, one of the boys who was on the Hudson bomber, they were out training in daylight on their own one day and we got the news that they had crashed a little way from the airfield and all on board were killed. And among them was the boy Drake, who we consider the best dancing partner in the camp. And the sad thing about him, he'd been awarded a British Empire Medal when he served in Darwin when it was bombed up there. And the sad part was he was his parents' only child. So uh, it was very sad and... We were asked if we would like to attend his funeral and that was a first experience too because at the funeral of a service person there is a short part of it where you have to march very, very slowly with your arms straight down the side of your thighs and it's the hardest thing to do when you're unhappy about something because you couldn't put your hands up to wipe a tear away, you couldn't move your hands to swing to keep you going And, Avis, it's important that people acknowledge that the losses for airmen, indeed all servicemen, were not just restricted to the front line, that many of our pilots died in training, as indeed Drake did, and it's just another cost of war. And that's what was so good about my conscience, that in the job we were doing, we were assisting those blokes who would go overseas to look after their plane and um, themselves, 
and do what they could and, and help train them to get out of a searchlight over some city at no cost of themselves. Sadly, it happened very often, but it was at sale where I had the main feeling of having help in the service, even though I didn't go outside Australia. I trained a boy who did. And Avis, what did you end up doing for the rest of the war after sale? Driving important people about. I was a good driver. I loved my Chev. I thought it was the most beautiful car on the road. I still do. Anyway, because of the condition, I kept my car and I came out of my driving school a half a point below a perfect score. And I think that was why I, I got posted to Victoria Barracks. And Avis, that half a point was 299.5 out of a possible 300 marks. A near perfect mark. Good on you. A near perfect mark. I've been driving a vehicle since I was 15, though I never had the licence. And I never had a civilian licence until I'd been out of the army three years. So, Avis, what did you end up doing after the war? Married a farmer. And I don't like animals. I married an ex-service man. He saw his duty mainly on Kokoda and around the Philippines. We married, had three children. Uh, my daughter had married. The two boys were working here in Warrnambool and each had girlfriends. So we were back to being just two again. Life on the farm had been hard. It wasn't good. And uh, I saw fit to leave my home, which I did. And I came down to Warrnambool to live. Included in one of the reasons I lived was only added many years later after I joined the RSL here in Warrnambool. And I realised that the type of man my husband was, and I didn't recognise it as the same thing then, that while we lived on the farm between Camperdown and Tarang, I wanted to join the RSL and he wouldn't let me. All those things are only out for making money. I'm not spending my good money on use the word bludgers and true there are some in everything but I was an army person he went and was on front line but he wasn't an army person I don't know whether you can make sense out of that or not but he refused to let me join the RSL when one looks back at modern military history and obviously the service of women today there's a lot more options that people can do today than what you did do you look back and feel that you were restricted in what was available for you? No. We were a very simple family. Black was black, white was white. There were colours between, but you didn't step out of line. So being brought up in that kind of a life, you don't do too much questioning. And if the officer said, as they told us on the Dali with our um, rookies course, line up girls, when I give the signal... You've all got to go walk through that hut. In the door, they said, walk through and out the door. That hut. OK, we did. When we got in, we were all choking, crying. It was gas and we'd been made walk through a room filled with gas. A little bit later, after we'd had a cup of tea and wiped the burning tears from the eyes, we were handed a gas mask and made walk through it again. The lesson was that if gas was bombed where we were, the mask would stop you from dying. So you did what you were told. But when you've been trained like that from your childhood, it's automatic to do what you've told. So, Avis, looking back on this huge life of service that you've given, it really seems that perhaps if you'd been a man as a mechanic, perhaps you may have had a bit more fun with it. Now, uh, use of the word fun. The sort of fun you mean, yes, had I been a man, I'd have pushed to go overseas. Used as a simple F-U-N, I had fun. I got punished for it, you know, kitchen police duty for doing the wrong thing. One girl made a stew one night. I'll try to keep it brief. Had it made a stew when, when she went to thicken it, there was no plain flour. Oh, we'll have, we'll have to use self-raising flour. Oh, that'll make it lumpy. And one girl come up with it, she said... Oh, when my mum wanted to pick an issue, she put rice in it. Oh, we've got rice. How much do you use? I don't know. 18 girls comparing with what flour you'd put in. They put about four cups of rice in it, and it came out like wood. 
the bombardier who didn't have a sense of humour and that gave us, we all called it KP, kitchen police duty, confined to barracks, and we thought she was unfair. Anyway, after we'd served that time and we were camped at Bexley on the Oakley, on the Georges River at that time, and she allowed us to go down to the edge of the river one afternoon for an hour's break. When we got down there, rivers weren't clean then like they are today. There were papers, tins, bottles, and what we found that helped us get into mischief, a whole heap of little green frogs. They were about, I'm talking wartime size now, uh, not even an inch in size. They were small. And one of the girls picked a handful of them up and threw them at one of the others, and it was hilarious. Oh, I'd like to put these in Bomb's bed. OK, we picked one of the tins up that was laying there. We put half a dozen of these little green frogs in it and took it back. The bombardier had left a note that she would be back on the dot at 12 o'clock. You'd better be in bed and lights out. So, after dark... We got into her cubicle and we short-sheeted her bed, leaving it open just enough to do the finishing work later. The bombardier was always dead spit on time and if she said she'd be back at 12, she'd be back at 12. So at quarter to 12, we get down to the bed again, got the frogs up, out, and put them in the short-sheeted bed and then tucked it in very hard because they might have got out, but they didn't, fortunately. And by 12, we were all in bed with our lights out. When the bombardier came in, she must have had a happy time because she was singing. Then we heard the light go out and heard the cot creak. We didn't have beds, they were only bunks, wire bunks. We heard her get in and the next minute, I think they would have heard her in central Sydney, (laughs) the scream she let out. And uh, she didn't see the funny side of it at all. So we were confined to barracks again. Two weekends, but uh, that sort of mischief you can get anywhere and you don't do it with the idea of hindering the work. It's a letting off steam and, well, we thought it was funny anyway. Avis, it's been a wonderful 95 years. How do you reflect on your time in the Army now? As far as I'm concerned, I'm still in the Army. Avis, it's been wonderful talking with you today. Thank you for coming on Life on the Line. Find out more about this podcast at www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com and join the conversation on social media at Life on the Line Podcast on Facebook and Instagram and at L-O-T-L Pod on Twitter. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening. And lest we forget... <laughs>